challenging the problems head on with faith, we are able to transform the problem into something of value creation for our life that's undeniable, such that more than just overcoming the problem, yes, we overcome the problems, but more than overcoming the problem, we become a better, stronger person in the process, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's why we practice. And if I can just, in conclusion, you know, I think that for me, faith is about making the impossible possible. Because you don't need faith for what you can already do. None of us do. Faith is, is to allow us to go beyond what we can do with our own sheer effort. And one of the things that I learned, and it's something that Nitrin tells us, he's, Nitrin says in one of the letters that he wrote, and that's what we study, we study the actual letters that he wrote to his followers. And in one of his letters, one of my favorites, it's called Reply to Kill All, he says, a coward cannot have any of his prayers answered. And so he's telling us that if we don't have the courage and the guts to challenge the things that maybe cause us the most fear and the most doubt in our life, then we will never ever really not only not overcome it, I think we deny ourselves another opportunity to prove to ourselves this amazing power that has always existed within our own life. You know, and so for me, just just one experience, and I'll try to make it brief. But my father was an alcoholic, a functional alcoholic, but an alcoholic nonetheless. And my mother left him when I was three years old. But my dad always remained in the same community because that's where my mother and my father were all born and raised. But because of my dad's alcoholism, um, you know, he most often forgot my birthday. He would forget Christmas. He would make dates with me and most often not show up. But if he did show up, he would take me to his mother's house and leave me while he went off to drink. And so for me, you know, I, I internalized that, you know, what, what, at three years old, right? And it continues, there must be something wrong with me, otherwise daddy would love me. And you know, that continued. My dad never paid child support. And I have the greatest mother on the planet. I do. I mean, an amazing woman. But my dad never paid child support. So I always did incredibly well in school. I was always at the top of my class. And so when I was around 16, I knew I wanted to go to college. And so my dad was a mechanical genius. He could take anything apart and put it back together. And so he was working on tractor trailers at the time, you know, mechanic making very good money. So I went to my dad and I asked him if he would give me $10 a week allowance because I wanted to put it in the bag, bank to save towards my college education. He said, of course, honey, of course. And I never saw the first $10. Um, I was very wounded. You know? And uh, I went to college and then uh, I came out here for law school. And because I was born and raised on the East Coast, I know that I, I only pl applied to USC as a joke. Um, all the other schools I applied to were on the East Coast because that's all I knew because I was born and raised on the East Coast. Um, but when I had to decide, you know, where I really wanted to go, you know, and I had a choice, um, I know that one of the reasons I decided to come out here was to run away from the pain with my with my dad, you know, in that relationship. And so, uh, so I did. And it was my second year of law school, thank goodness I came out here, someone introduced me to this practice. And I started to practice. And I was, I don't know, somewhere around a five, six year member at the time. It was December, I'll never forget. And I got a call from a family member who told me that my father had just had a massive heart attack and stroke. He was left paralyzed on the left side of his body, and he did not recognize anyone. And they told me that his condition was so serious they did not think he would live to see Christmas of that year. And so they, they asked me, are you going to come home? And I'm like, why? Honestly. You know, I was like, it's too late. 
If he doesn't recognize his own brothers and sisters, there's no way he's going to recognize me. It's like too late now. You know, that was my feeling. And then, quite honestly, all the pain and the anger and the hurt, you know, all that stuff really started erupting out of my life. And um, I went to see, uh, because this is a lay-led organization rather than priest, we have, um, you know, us ordinary people who take leadership responsibility to help each other in faith. So I went to one of my leaders for encouragement, and she was very strict with me. And she told me I better change this relationship now with my dad before he died, because if I didn't, you know, I'd have this regret for the rest of my life. And she got me. I knew that to be true, because I had moved over 3,000 miles away, and I discovered I couldn't run away from the pain, right? As long as I took me everywhere I go, I, you know, I still feel everything. So I knew that to be true. And um, she, she, you know, she's a real bossy lady, so she told me I needed to chant two hours every day. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so I started. I started chanting two hours every day of Nam Myoho And um, nothing changed in my father's condition. Nothing. And because, you know, I'm, I, you know, certainly as a lawyer, I'm trained to use my brain. So every, I mean, I chanted two hours every day, but it was a battle with me. Because inside it was like, Linda, you're nuts. <laughs> I mean, how are saying words to a piece of paper <laughs> literally going, you know what I mean? Honestly, you, you get very intellectual. How are saying these words to a piece of paper going to change this situation? I mean, this is impossible, right? I mean, it seemed intellectually. So every day, I made my two hours, and I really prayed as sincerely as I could to somehow change my relationship with my dad before I died. But every day was a pain. You know, I this struggle inside of me of, you're nuts. You have lost your mind. You're wasting your time. What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. The evil twin, right? We were fighting constantly for those, two, you know, two hours. Christmas Eve, my favorite uncle died unexpectedly. He had been like my father to me all my life. And so I immediately, you know, got on a plane and flew home. And um, nothing had still changed. Dad still didn't recognize anybody, you know, but I couldn't, no matter how much pain I felt, I could not possibly be home and not go see my dad in the hospital. And I remember, you know, very vividly standing outside of his hospital door trying to get the courage to walk through, you know. Um, and I finally did. And I finally mustered up the energy. And as soon as I walked through that door, my dad saw me. He called out my name. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was amazing. The nurse was in shock. I was in shock. And then my dad started to talk to me. And he just started to cry and cry and cry and cry. And it was like, with every tear, he washed away all of the pain. You know, it was like in that moment, my dad was like 58 years old and he looked like he was 98. And I truly saw that no human being escapes the strictness of cause and effect. And he was dearly paying for everything he had done and not done in his life. It was so clear, you know? And, and, and in that moment of him crying, I also realized that while he might not have been the one I think I would have ordered as a father, <laughs> I truly understood that he loved me as much as it was humanly possible for him to love somebody, you know? And so my dad asked me to take his pain away. So I got him to start chanting with me. From the moment he recognized me, he recognized everybody. We extended my dad's life for a year. And um, he still remained paralyzed on the left side of his body, so we had to move him into a convalescent home. But it was a year in which I had a father-daughter relationship with my dad. You know? 
he was surrounded by his family for the last year of his life. And when he died, I had absolutely no regrets. That is what this Buddhism is about to me. It is giving each human being the tools by which you can confront the weaknesses and the negativity in your life, and you can change it. It's giving you the tools to change your own destiny. It's giving you the key to your own self-empowerment. That is what this Buddhism is about. And for me, it is, it is a hard practice. It is a very hard practice to chant every morning and every evening. It, it's hard. It's difficult. It's hard. It looks like a piece of paper, but when you sit down, crap comes out of your mouth. Unbelievable. Isn't it true? <laughs> because it is a mirror by which we get to see ourselves. It is not easy. But what I discovered is it's the greatest gift we give ourselves. Because it allows me every day to take the best Linda out into the world rather than the weakest Linda. You know what I mean? It allows me, while challenging problems, to develop an inner state of life where I can enjoy the process. Where I can literally enjoy every day as I'm working to change my life in various aspects of my life. It's allowed me to experience joy that I never knew was even possible for a human being. And to me, that's what this Buddhism is about. So I want to thank everyone. For